This episode of the AD History Podcast is brought to you by listeners like you, supporting the show on Patreon. Join Odo's AD Fight Army at patreon.com slash AD History Podcast, where you can enjoy new episodes 48 hours early, the special director's cut version of each episode, and more. Join us in creating the AD history you deserve, and go to patreon.com slash AD History Podcast to learn more. Thank you. Have you ever wondered how the city of Rome was sacked for the first time in near eight centuries, or how the vacuum of power was filled immediately following Rome's evacuation from Britain? Well, do we have some stories for you. This is the AD History Podcast, weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD. Powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. (laughs) And Patrick, how's everybody's YouTube's number one Leon Trotsky impersonator on this very warm summer day. That is a terrific uh, way to explain today, Paul. It's very, very, very hot today. So Britain just hit 40 degrees. What on ever that is in Fahrenheit for the first time in recorded quite, history today. Quite hot. Yeah, super hot. Like, But we're managing. Um, hope you're managing. It might be hot wherever you are as well. Hope you're oh, a bit chillier. Yeah, I mean, mine is unless you're like, doing your Australian winter, if you're listening down there, then you should be a bit fine. But we're very hot here, Paul. We're managing, though. How are you doing? You know what? It is the middle of summer, which I suppose mentioning it does date the episode somewhat down when it's getting listened to whenever oh. far down the line from we are from recording. But that's okay. I, I like having... <laughs> I like keeping track of things in those kind of odd and idiosyncratic ways yeah, that it's kind always of develop good over time. You know, we've got we've got the COVID episodes. Oh, boy, that's so yeah. much of our first couple, first mm. two and a half seasons there about when you stop and think mm. about it. Goodness, and even into our third. But hey, we seem to be living in a post-pandemic world now. And with yeah. that, Patrick, what do you got for us today? So I'm kind of covering or continuing what we talked about in our last episode the uh, fall of Roman Britain so uh, while we watched Roman Britain disappear in our last episode this episode is covering the immediate aftermath of what happened straight after that and it's kind of all tied together in a really cool legend I need to stress it's a legend I'm not 100% sure of how true some of the events I'm about to talk about are but they're historically important it's believed to be what happened in this very crazy time for my home island. But Paul, what have you got in store for us today? Well, today I'm finishing up our story on the Visigoth king, Alark I, who literally comes in and sacks the Italian peninsula. And it's a fantastic story. Certainly, if you have not familiar with part one, part one is in our previous episode, which if you've not listened to it, very strongly recommend that you do because the story will make a heck of a lot more sense, to be sure. And that's where we're going with that. It's it's going to be a lot of fun. I always enjoy finishing up these two-parters where you get into certain chapters and certain portions of history that, mm. quite frankly, just can't be covered in an entire episode. And I'm very much looking forward to that later on. But with all of that in mind and now all of it out of the way, it is time to lay down our necessary, obligatory, now legendary AD History Podcast ground rules. 1. Evaluate events in the context they occurred. 2. Over the span of recorded history, the way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are and were important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it even 50 years ago. 3. Nothing in history was inevitable. And 4. History and the past is like a different country. Now, Patrick, you got ourselves a legend coming up here. And it's interesting because you think, oh, well, legend. What possible role could that really functionally play in history? And the truth is quite a lot. Because there are always certain truths in a variety of legends. 
And it also very much plays into one of the bigger themes of 80 history, which is how history is understood. Mm, totally. Both by people that are living through it, so that prospective view, and just how understanding, accurate or otherwise, very much just shapes our view of history and, and how that shapes greater cultural identities for nations and peoples. Mm. And in this case, you're talking about, obviously, a very unstable time in this immediate post-Roman Britain where there's a tremendous vacuum. And if there's one thing that's certain, both human nature and the universe in many respects abhor a vacuum, save mm. the vacuum of space. <laughs> and even some claim that it's not truly a vacuum itself, but that's a minor point. But with that in mind, Mr. Foot. Sir Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you, Paul. So it's it's really important to set the scene with this one, and it's that the Romans are gone. And that's a huge deal. This is something that people like Bodicea, Boudicca, however you want to say her name, and so many others like her dreamed of nearly 400 years ago. It's finally happened. But it's... It's not a happy time. It's so much time has passed since that's top of time wishing the Romans to be gone. Britain has fundamentally changed and not all is well in these aisles. And though this is by no means a mm. one for one comparison that I'm about to make, mm. but I do think it is at the very least a fine general example of the kind of serious vacuum and the chaos that can ensue when a greater power for one reason or another, leaves a particular area and their influence goes with it mm. and how that can just create an entire upheaval. And though, like I said, this is by no means emphasize a one-for-one -one comparison here, but think about the United States and its allies leaving Afghanistan. It is a, by no means a one-for-one, one, but no, it's a terrific analogy. That's such a recent analogy as well. That was only last year or so ago at time of recording. Yeah. Um, it is a very, very astute point to make. Like I said, it's by no means one-on-one, -on -one, but no, it's totally that sort of same thing going on here for for so many years now. You know, more than how, how long were, were, were the U.S. in Afghanistan? Like 20 very long. About 20 years, almost, so it's almost 20 years, yeah. and I think it would have been October 2021 that would have been the 20-year the anniversary, yeah. but it just gives, it's an idea of yeah. the kind of oh, chaos no. that such a vacuum can create. When, when there's been a, one regime in a country, in a place for so long, and all of a sudden they're gone, it, it creates that kind of, you know, that's a really great analogy to make here, Paul, that's a really great one. I have my moments. Yeah, have your moments, oh, many of them. But yeah, so Roman oh has God. become so entrenched in this Roman way of life that without them, things really couldn't function. And Britain depended on the Romans, not just for their economy, but their, for their protection. Like the Britons did not have their own army, their own military at all. They were dependent on Rome. So without them, without the Romans in Britain, this sort of thing that people like Bodicea yearned for, Roman free Britain. But now, without the Romans, chaos ensued. And this is really the start of sub-Roman Britain. And the Britons were being attacked from all angles and by angles. <laughs> but I'm trying to oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. There it is. That came in handy. <laughs> but yes, they were attacked from all angles by the angles. Uh, so Romans had left Britain. So the Romans had left Britain because Rome itself, European Rome, mainland Rome, was being invaded by bar by barbarians of all kinds. But this was like the exact same issue that was going on in Britain itself. Of course, there were the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes, but. Britons were also facing a threat much close to home too. Of course, we had the Picts who were attacking from modern Scotland. And from Ireland, we had a tribe, this might sound a bit confusing, but a tribe called the Scotti. <laughs> so, yeah. make sure I get this straight. 
Mm. I think I have an idea, but I, it's a question that's worth clarifying mm. and certainly worth asking. So these barbarians from Ireland were mm. called the Scotti? Yeah, and it's one of those sort of strange things in history. So Ireland and Scotland, of course, have a real close connection. I think, in fact, that the part of the island of Great Britain that's actually closest to Ireland is a part of Scotland in its southwest. I can't remember its exact name. There's been sort of debates about building a bridge to Ireland from there, but of course, that hasn't happened. Um, there's definitely a lot of cross-pollination between the languages there as well and the people there. Uh, so I believe modern Scotland, I don't think it's named after this Scotty or the Scotty. It's believed it's named after another tribe called the Scots. But whether there was much connection between the Scotty and these Scots, we don't know. They could have been their forebearers or something like that. But no, it's very odd to hear that people from Ireland were called the Scotty. It's, it's very strange. One of those strange things in history. It most certainly mm. is. But, you know, here we are. Yeah. And so Britain had depended on the Roman army for their own protection. So with them gone, they were absolutely defenseless. They had no army of their own. So here's something interesting. At this moment of crisis, the Britons actually asked for help from the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. And it's just worth mentioning here that, as I've already said, we're going into the world of legends with this one. All of this can be very much up for debate. There might be like conflicting theories and hypotheses we come to. Uh, it could be debates about when this all happened, if it happened at all. Because the Romans are really great at recording history. They're very just great at that. And we kind of get to this point in AD history as a whole. Well, that's going to start to disappear to an extent because it's hard to figure out the facts from the fiction, you know, this is the early Middle Ages we're really starting to get ourselves into. We're not fully there quite yet, but this is, especially in Britain anyway, like Britain has sort of entered its Middle Ages. And the early Middle Ages are called a Dark Age for a reason. It's not because there was no sunshine. It's because we're so dark on the knowledge we have from this period. because People just weren't in the business of note-taking at this time. Yeah, there, with the chaos goes out the window a lot mm. of different stuff that folks like you and myself, students of history, presenters of history, mm. very much benefit from. And, you know, in this case, and this is something we were talking about during our Library of Alexandria mm. discussion from a couple episodes back, which is that we're very much coming into a time now, really, I think, probably the first truly palpable time in our epic journey through world mm. history, this tapestry that we've been putting together now, and how we're beginning to see that interesting phenomenon of the two-step forward, one-step back. Yeah, and it's... So, like, research in Middle Ages, as we're going to read... I've always found it strange, because the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages medieval times, whatever you want to call them, they sound like the stories from that period of time and the actions of people, they sound so much more old-fashioned than what we knew of like ancient Rome and ancient Greece. You know, every time, this is just a brief aside, every mm. time you use the term medieval times, yes, specifically for those from the United States, especially if you grew up in the Northeast, oh, okay. there, there was this kind of, I guess it's an attraction of sorts, it was a show. <laughs> where it like a lot of like school classes went to it and whatnot where you go and it's this whole a stereotypically almost like british medieval production okay, where like you see joust and you have and oh, fantastic. at the time you're you're eating from these large you know pheasant <laughs> drumsticks and it's it's a fantastic experience it's totally based on the stereotypical as yeah well. But just a whole lot of fun. So every time you, I hear you use the term medieval times, it just brings up those brings memories and those oh. images. So there's going to be some of you out there, especially from the northeast of the United States, that will say, I know exactly what he's <laughs> yeah. talking about. But it's hard to deny, like, when you hear about 1066 and or, uh, like the, the British still invasion, a long way off. it's still a huge way off. But even just the artwork from this time period, how did we go from the beautiful marble, marble and mosaics of Rome to like really quite shoddy looking drawings of the Middle Ages. And like, 
the ideal the ideologies of the middle ages it, it really was a huge step back it was a very strange time oh it very much was and, yeah and it's amazing that we're able to go through it in such detail like yes watching it unfold in such minute detail my goodness yes. yeah and speaking of that detail so this is where that kind of legend of it all comes into fact um so as we mentioned, the Britons decided to form a pact with the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes. Um, and one of these stories focuses on someone called Vortigern. And just to say, he probably wasn't actually called Vortigern. This is a Celtic term, meaning something like great chief or supreme lord. We don't know his actual name, but for all intents and purposes, he's called Vortigern. Uh, he is believed to be in some kind of king of the Britons. We don't know exactly he was at least the highest source of authority in this post-Roman landscape for Britain. And with the Picts and Scotti attacking, he knew his land needed help fighting back. And it's actually he who asked the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes to help. Yeah, so like the Romans before him, he invited them to the island. This is exactly what happened with the Anglo-Saxons mm -hmm. in Roman Britain. They were invited over, and it's just bizarre to see it happen again. Yes, you know, this mm. doesn't, I mean, this is interesting, though. Doesn't this contradict the previously mentioned idea that the Anglo-Saxons came over because they saw that Britain was defenseless? Yeah, kind of, basically. As I've said, like, we're getting to an extent. Sort of, to an extent, yeah, it does to an extent. I'm sure there were many Anglo-Saxons who realized, hey, Britain's defenseless. Kind of like, this was probably the cherry on the cake, you can imagine it. The Anglo-Saxons saw Britain was defenseless and go, hey, let's go and claim it for ourselves. And on top of that, not only would they think about doing it, they were invited over as well. Like it, it was probably just it was probably a mix of A and mix of B as history so often is. So it's just I mean just mm. a perfect opportunity meeting ambition. Yes. Yeah. You know that in coming over, just because Britain appears defenseless doesn't mean there won't be some cost in doing it, but boy, does the cost go down significantly when they roll out the red carpet. Of course, yeah, definitely. Um, so the Britons and the Saxons, Anglos and Jutes, they negotiated for some time. And they came to the decision that there would be a group of Saxon mercenaries, and they were installed in Britain to protect the country. And these mercenaries were led by two Saxon warriors called Hengist and Horsa, even the names we're starting to hear, Paul, in um in AD history, are starting to sound more middle aged, like Hengist, Holliser. We're far away from like your Claudiuses, your Aurelians. Like we're really so much to... more guttural, almost Germanic. Yeah, yeah, very, very Germanic, and it just shows the change. We're going through a big period of change here on the channel, here on the podcast, and of course in world history as well. And uh, Hengist and Holliser, they were two Saxon brothers, but. This pact would not last all too long because eventually Hengist and Holliser turned on Vortigern, which who saw that coming? <laughs> well, I guess some things don't change that much. Mm. So we've got to ask ourselves, do we know why Hengist and Holliser betrayed Vortigern? We kind of have ideas, and this kind of comes into another legend. There's this sort of great legendary story from the history of Britain. And it kind of played in some very real history as well, to a degree. And I'm going to say the name of this legend. It's called The Treachery of the Long Knives. And I'm sure, Paul, that's just eating away at you, that name, Treachery uh, that of the Long Knives. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately goes to the Knight of the Long Knives. Yeah. Albeit 1,500 years later. Yes, a very, but very long time I, when later. I, when I see long knives, like, okay, I have, uh, this is interesting. I'm learning something here. Is there any chance that this particular legend, Treachery of the Long Knives, inspired the naming of what we now know quite infamously as the Knight of the Long Knives? Uh, there are beliefs that uh, they were, the Nazi party were inspired by uh, this story of the Church of the Long Knives when it came to calling it the Knight of the Long Knives. And it might seem strange at first, that like, this is a British legend, this is British history. Was Why would Germans, why would a German political party choose to honour a British legend? Well, where are the Anglo-Saxons from? Yeah, where are the Anglo-Saxons from? 
they were from Germany. This is very much a sort of German taking over story here. So that's what I pieced together as well. Paul, what are your thoughts on it? Do you think there's any sort of parallels there? Do you have any hypotheses of your own why they might choose to use that name? Well, the one thing that I can say with certainty, though mm. it is by no means my making a definitive connection here, mm. but it is important to note that once we're talking about the long night of the long knives from mm. I believe it was thirty four. I think it was yes. thirty four. Is you have to remember that within that patchwork whacked out ideology that is known as Nazism, mm. especially on the racial side of things, it considered the British and the Germans to be kindred peoples that are very much on mm. top of that that Nazi. How Aryan interesting. Yeah. Yes. So there, it would not be out of character or outside of the ideological framework that something like that could actually fit quite seamlessly. How interesting. But yeah, so it's definitely like even, even this far back, we're seeing links to such modern history is really fascinating. Those who are not familiar, the Night of the Long Knives was an internal purge that was kicked off with Hitler. He had made a pact with the, the Wehrmacht, the German military, and it had to do with who had primacy over the German military. Was it going to be the traditional Junker Prussian officer corps, the professional military that, of course, had been so reduced after the Treaty of Versailles, or was it going to be the Nazi SA stormtroopers that were basically street fighters in mm. that rise to power that Nazism undertook. And so basically Hitler used the SS to knock off the SA, which was headed by Ernst Röhm. And Ernst Röhm was a long time uh, follower of Hitler. And so basically in order for Hitler to get the military behind him, the formal professional military behind him, he basically had to declaw the SA, because they were very numerous at this point. I think they may have even gone into the millions, certainly the hundreds of thousands, which was quite a lot, mm. to be sure. And so he Hitler used the SS to knock off Ernst Strom and the leadership of the SA in what is known today to history as the Night of the Long Knives. Mm. So... Aside, just so everybody's up on it, just in case they're not familiar with the in on that. Yes. So oh, we'll... let's talk about this legend, though. Yeah. The treachery of the Long Knives. Uh, and the actual Night of the Long Knives we'll definitely talk about when we get to it in the far future. Yes. Um. So, yeah, this myth supposedly tells us what happened when Hengist and Horsa turned on Vortigern. And the story goes that Vortigern was really happy with how well Hengist and Horsa were protecting his country. And supposedly, as a thank you, Vortigern gave Hengus and Horsa the Isle of Fanet, which is in Kent at, the, at, at present. There's actually a peninsula. It's not really an island, which is a big shock. That's one of the big revelations I had here. Uh, and despite being given a whole peninsula to rule over, Hengus and Horsa were really unsatisfied. They wanted all of Britain, especially, you know, this probably links in quite neatly into the whole, the Anglo-Saxons believed they, it, Britain was theirs for the taking. They thought, we can take Britain, the Romans are gone, we've been invited here, and all we've been given is a bloody peninsula? Now, we want the whole island. Yes, of course. I mean, that's the whole idea is that you don't go in just to have a, a fiefdom. You want the whole idea. You want the whole pie. So, Hengus and Horsa hatched a plan together, and they convinced Vortigern to let them bring over more Anglo-Saxon soldiers. They were like, hey, we need more people. More people equals more protection. Uh, this is what they told Vortigern, and he agreed. So more Anglo-Saxons came over to Britain, which increased the Anglo-Saxon army, which meant they won more battles against the Picts and such. And this allowed Vortigern to say, hey, have more Saxons come over. Come on, bring more over. And not only did uh, Vortigern uh, let more Anglo-Saxons arrive, but he granted them more and more land. It's mm. almost like, it's like a kid's book or something, it's sort of like increasing, it reminds me of something like from Roald Dahl or something, but just this sort of slow trickle through of more Anglo-Saxons given more land, which means they have more power. 
yes. and the Anglo-Saxons had land in the south and north of Britain. They had all over the island. Well, what we know now is modern England. Uh, they had land everywhere. And as their numbers grew, Vortigern actually grew more dependent on them. And this worried many of the nobles of Britain, which included Vortigern's son called Vortimer. Similar names, but we'll manage. Uh, after a word of wisdom from his peers, Vortigern agreed. He went, yeah, this is kind of getting a bit silly. We need to get rid of the Anglo-Saxons. They've taken over so much of the island. There's so many of them now. Let's try and get yeah. rid of them. You know, it was Vortigern's fault. But um, this led to a series of battles. And perhaps one of the highlights of this battle was uh, that Vortimer, that son of Vortigern, he was at the helm. And he's actually seen as being a pretty competent leader. And it was during one of these battles that Horsa, one of these Anglo-Saxon leader brothers, was killed. So Hengus is still about Horsa killed. Uh, and after some battling, the Britons and Anglo-Saxons, they actually agreed to try and compromise over a meal to figure out how to sort things out on this island. So just barbarically killing one another. Uh, so Vortigern was really pleased with this result. But Hengus, he was angered by his brother's death. He had other plans. And it was promised that during this meal, this peace negotiating meal, there will be no weapons present. Of course, Hengus didn't listen to that, though. Uh, he, he ordered all his men to conceal a long knife in their long coats hmm. and await his command. And the command was Nemet or Saxus. And this is when all the Anglo Saxons revealed their weapons. I don't know exactly what. Nemet or Saxus means. I, I imagine it means something along the lines of unveil your sword. Because Saxus, so the Saxons are named after a specific kind of knife. They wield they wielded the Sax, the Saxus uh, sword such knife. That's where their name came from. So I presume that's what the Saxus and Nemet or Saxus means. And it's also where uh it's all, if you see somewhere with sex in its name in the UK, it comes from the Saxons, from Sussex, from Wessex, from Essex. That means mm. basically the West. So Wessex means the Western Saxons. Essex means the Eastern Saxons. It all comes from that knife. So that's where that that explains that term a little bit as well. But the order was simple. When they revealed their weapons, all of uh, Hengus's men had one simple instruction, and that was to stab the nearest Briton to them to death. And they did just this, you know, there's a very strong red wedding vibes going on here during all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually during this chaos that Hengus took Vortigern hostage. And Hengus demanded Vortigern give up his hold on the country. And finally, Vortigern said, yes, okay, I, 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 I relinquish my powers. And this gave Hengus some really new powers. And he took over London and then went on to claim other parts of England. And as for Vortigern, it was actually believed he fled he didn't die at this point. He supposedly fled into Cambria, which we know now as Wales. Like I said, this is a complete legend. We're not sure how much of this is true or whether it happened or not. But like you said at the beginning, Paul, there's definitely validity in legends like this. There must be some truth in all of this, that's for sure. Hints, peaks, mm. little bits and bobs, as it mm. were. But now the thing I'm curious about here, because mm. you would know in this case, how does history tend to remember Vortigern, Hengist, and Horsa? To an average British person, I don't think they're particularly well known. I'd only really stumbled upon them upon them while researching this video. But Vortigern is seen as an absolute tool. He <laughs> he was the one. He's basically seen as the person who let Britain finally fall to the Anglo-Saxon regime. Hengus and Horsa, they get off quite well. So Hengus, obviously Horsa died supposedly during one of those battles. Hengus, I believe, is seen as the first king of Kent. Kent is the uh, region, the county of the mm -hmm. Britain in its southeast, southeast of London is Kent. Hengus is seen as the first king of the Kentish. Uh, so he has quite a legacy here as well. It was obviously Kent doesn't have its own king or queen these days is part of the wider british empire britain the uk but he's got quite a legacy behind him now as far as this being worth remembering it just, mm. if it's only a legend of sorts but do we really have any sort of indication as to how accurate this really was 
a lot of sources talk about it. If you go into a lot of sources in regards to what happened in the aftermath of Roman Britain, a lot of this comes up. And if there's that many historical sources talking about it, and not all of them are as heavy on the this is only a legend break, a lot of them sort of talk about more inaccuracies. I like to just be a bit more cautious because I'm a bit of a cautious person like that. But I think there definitely is some validity to this. I think one of the biggest um, things that go against it is the fact that it implies that the Anglo-Saxons took over immediately after the fall of Vortigern. But once again, while like, even though I'm talking about this in our 411 to 420 episode, yeah. this could have potentially happened much later into the sub-Roman British period. This could happen towards the tail end when it became more Anglo-Saxon. We don't know entirely. Roughly, how long are we talking about in terms of the period that is largely denoted as sub-Roman Britain? So some people genuinely, at its widest, it goes into about the late 6th century, which is kind of when the Roman Empire unto itself truly comes to an end as well. So it could have been that far into it, but it could have been at the beginning as well. Like I said, this really is one of the biggest issues we have with this legend. We don't exactly know when it happened. We know it happened in the time between the end of Rome and the true establishment of Anglo-Saxon Britain, but we're not sure exactly when. So I thought I'd mention it now. Of course. <laughs> it makes total sense. But what I would like to go back into now is stray away from legend and go more into the reality of what happened in the immediate aftermath of Roman Britain. Of course. And as I mentioned, Vortigern fled to Wales. And he probably wasn't the only one who did this. Many Britons, in fear of their lives, fled to like the outlands of the island. Um, so most Anglo-Saxons arrived via the southeast through Dover, Kent, Essex, in that sort of general area. That's the sort of much in the same way that that's where most that that's the truly more Roman part of the country. It's why London's in the southeast. It's why so much of that is so Roman. And that was the same for the Anglo-Saxons, where they first appeared from as well. It's why Essex and Sussex and Wessex, as I just mentioned, they're all in that general area. So you wanted to escape that area if you didn't want to be integrated into Anglo-Saxon life. Uh, so this meant that the further southeast you got, the better your chances were. Wales was a particularly good option, even though it wasn't as far as, say, York, and York was became a particularly Roman Anglo-Saxon place. It had real, real intense geography. It was hard to access Wales. To this day, it's still a very mountainous part of the country. Um, beautiful part of the country, but very rugged terrain, much harder to penetrate, hence when many people fled to Wales. But it wasn't just there. One of the furthest corners of the country is kind of is the southwest, your Cornwalls, your Devons, those sort of parts. A lot of people, a lot of Britons fled to that sort of nook of the country to avoid Anglo-Saxon influence. And likewise, Cumbria too, which is in the northwest of the island. And of course, Scotland maintained fiercely anti-Anglo-Saxon, anti-Roman too. And what's interesting is that this sort of exodus of Southeast England and other parts of England really kind of lives on to this day. Places like Cornwall and Wales and Cumbria and Scotland still have a really strong Celtic identity. They very oh, much goodness. have that. Yeah, they still have a very strong, unique identity. There's calls for like Cornish independence, calls for Welsh independence. I've heard of this, yeah. Yeah, calls for Scottish independence. You know, they have a much more unique identity unto themselves that isn't really shared with the rest of England. Like places like Sussex or London don't really have a very Celtic identity. Their identity is being English. Mm. Whereas places like that have very much their own stronger cultural identity, which dates back all the way back to this time in history. And that's just shocking to see how far like those sort of ties, that identity, that sort of national politics, even I'm reading a book at the moment of the history of Great Britain. It's a big free volume book. It's really fascinating. Written by whom? Uh, Simon Sharma, I believe. What's the name of it? It's called The History of Great Britain. So it's actually a BBC series as well. I'm just checking. I say listen, uh, reading. I'm actually listening to it. I believe it's by Simon Sharma. 
It's a free book series. I believe it was also coincided with a documentary he made for the BBC as well. Yeah, the BBC is really into doing that. Yeah, Simon Sharma it's written by. So I'm, on, I'm only on book one at the moment. But um, it talks about nationalist politics and mm -hmm. how we often think of nationalist politics as being a very relatively new invention. But that isn't the case at all. It goes back to this sort of national pride, identity, national identity, having pride in that. And that dates back to places like this. It's just fascinating. But also, it's a really fascinating book as well. Go read it if you can. By all means. Uh, and the last thing I want to wrap up here, because this is just sort of talking about the loose ends of Rome and Britain, what happened when Rome and Britain came to an end. Something I found fascinating was what became of Roman buildings. Mm. And, you know, it's no surprise. That's a, that's, that's a legitimate question and, and point of inquiry yeah. here. Because obviously, as you've told me, the country is is filled with them, especially in the South. Mm. So clearly they endured, but in what capacity post-Rome? So they endured to an extent. While there are some very well-preserved Roman remains in Britain, Fishbourne Palace comes to mind uh, most noticeably. A lot of them are in horrendous disuse. So if you think the Colosseum looks bad, like most of like Hadrian's Wall in this day and age, it's just a line of bricks, really. So many of them fell into disuse. You know, I, I think mm. about you, you say how the how the Colosseum looks, and mm. yes, certainly, certainly not its heyday, but for something that was constructed just about two thousand years ago. Oh no, it looks very. It's good, doing yeah. all right. Oh no, it's doing it's horrendously doing right. well. No, I'm saying, but I'm saying yeah. compared to that, yeah, you know, yeah, what we have in Britain sure. isn't of that quality we have the occasional bit like, like fishbourne palace mm. uh which is amazing marbling but this is fundamentally because the britons they really had no need for like bath houses or fancy palaces they were going through a crisis they don't have time to think about that and places like hadrian's wall or these sort of fancy palaces they made for pretty good resource piles because why go rummaging for rocks and wood when you've got entire empty palaces that aren't being used at all. And this is something we see throughout history, that these landmarks being torn apart to be used as uh, resources for other buildings. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment, because something I really find interesting. But this kind of cements to us that basically a lot of these Roman buildings fell into a state of disrepair pretty darn quickly. And the way Roman buildings look to us today is probably pretty similar to what they look like in Anglo-Saxon Britain. They fell into a state of disrepair super, super quickly. And the historians in us, Paul, mm. it can make us scream, like, why didn't they preserve these things? Because <laughs> they had more important things to think about. A hundred percent. And it's kind of like the argument you see of the Great Wall. We all know that the Great Wall of China has been really diminished due to people using its bricks for other buildings. And another sure. great example is somewhere like the Berlin Wall. People are like, oh, why did you knock the Berlin Wall down? That's an amazing historic landmark. <laughs> but to I can those think of a few good reasons yeah. why you might want to, have got, want to get rid of the thing. To those people in the 90s thinking that that wall had divided their country, their city for so long, they weren't thinking about future historians wanting to preserve it. They wanted it gone there and then. And that's kind of what's happening here in Roman Britain. They didn't care about preserving Roman palaces. They're much more important things to think about. And I just find like it... I think Putting food in their mouths, coming exactly. together with the working government. Exactly. And so much more going on. Yeah, that ton but I just find that fascinating. I think it's something worth mentioning here. But Oh, yes. Goodness, yes. Suffice to say, Britain was a really changing place. Uh, and whether it changed as quickly as the myth of Vortigern, Hengus, and Horse tells us, that remains to be seen. But there's one thing that is for certain, however. You can already see it with the language I'm using in this video, the the, this episode, the names I'm using, what we, the events we're talking about. Britain will never be the same as it was under Rome, for better and no, worse. No, certainly not. For better and worse. Like, we're changing here, folks. Yes, very much so. Mm. And... I'm really enjoying watching this change occur. Yeah, it's, it's it's fascinating to see how it go from this great part of the empire, what do we call it, fertile in tyrants, <laughs> to what it is now, just this absolute it's, chaos. Yes, yeah. it is. And from what I understand, it's going to remain in some chaos for some time. 
Yeah, which I not, suppose is to be expected. Though I must admit, I'm not entirely sure I'm going to be carrying on this trail in the next episode. That's been two episodes of Roman Britain, sub Roman Britain so far. I might see what's happening elsewhere in the world at this moment, but it's been great, fascinating to see Britain come to the end of its first great period of history. You know, British history, most people started with Roman Britain. We've got well, pre Roman Britain, Roman Britain, and that's kind of over now. It is over now. It definitely fits into your general pattern of mm. how you've handled history so far relevant to our show mm. of the island you call home, which is to say, you come in and out at points of particular note. Yeah. Well, let's see what's going on at the right times. Yes, it's almost its own sub-series in a way, mm. you know, scattered over four plus seasons now on to the fifth. <laughs> so I know it, it I, I like how you've approached it mm. so far. It, it's oh, thank been you. Uh, well, thank you. It's been very salient. As you listening, especially if you are a longtime listener of AD History, know I take great enjoyment anytime Patrick decides to go into the ancient history relevant to our show, relevant to where it is and the point of time that the show is covering, where he is able to give insight that a, a non Briton or a non Patrick Foot Breton, to be more accurately, could mm. never give otherwise. And that is always a treat. Thank you very much. No, I love, I always enjoy it and talk about Britain. And goodbye, Roman Britain. We hardly knew ye. <laughs> you would think so, even though we're talking basically 400 or so yeah. years of, of the thing. But us here, you there. And we'll be back right afterward from 1 AD. This is the AD History Podcast. Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History PC and the hashtag AD History. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. Also, check out the AD History Podcast on Patreon. See how you can help support the show and the rewards that await you by exploring the AD History podcast on Patreon. See the link in the description. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. Oh yeah, here it is. The old 1812 <laughs> Overture. Thank you, Tchaikovsky, for your contribution. And in this case, of course, now, as you know, has become established a thing here in 80 history mm. is that for our now famous, nay, legendary Patreon submitted questions segment is always partnered by that bit by Tchaikovsky, yes. the 1812 Overture. And if you want to join Odo's Adiophyte army and helping us continue to make the 80 history you deserve, make more of it doing it and doing a better job and just being an even more integral part of the show. Join Odo's ADFI Army at patreon.com slash adhistorypodcast at the $5 a month tier or higher, which in addition to all of the other elements of the show is one where you and all the other amazing benefits, of course, can ask a question for Patrick and myself to answer on air in our legendary middle segment. And this one is interesting, Patrick, because it doesn't come from any one patron no. in particular, mm. nor does it come from any one listener in particular, because it's something we get asked a lot of times. And this is a much more conceptual thing. This is not a technical thing. This is conceptual, which is, you know, how did you come up with AD history? How do you decide what you, de you know, how do you decide in terms of how it's structured and how you want to go about doing it and the way you want to do it? And you and I were talking and we figured, well, let's show you listening or watching us wherever you may be listening or watching us right now. Because mm. there's something that I know you and I, Patrick, have wrangled with in our own mind for quite a while, even though it's still a long way off. And that, of course, is how do we handle 
the show in terms of its structure, when we start getting into periods of time where the events are so detailed because we have so much more information yeah. and there's just so much more going on and history becomes such so global in its consequence. So many things happen in one place that trigger events in distant parts of the others and things become deeply intertwined. Like, for example, how does AD history deal with the 1940s? Yeah, it's one of those things that has always been on the back burner, in the back of my mind in regards to AD history. It, the current format of the show works super well for the period of history we're in. And because there's enough information out there, but not too much information out there, the decade structure just works fantastically. But when we get to the 40s, the 20th century in general, when there's so, not only is there more information out there, but there's much more happening on a world stage. How do we cover that? How do we give a decade like the 40s justice? How do we, how do we restructure AD history to fit that much history in? And it's and like, how would you even like cover something like the Napoleonic Wars? Yeah, totally. Like, and I've I've kind of come to a few ideas. I'm sure you have a few as well, Paul. I guess the first idea is we just keep things the same. So we just keep on doing episodes decade by decade. We do an episode on the 40s, do an episode on the 50s, so on. But then we have our what we missed episodes. So what we missed was kind of an idea we had to kind of future proof ourselves. While they aren't massively relevant now. As the years go on, they will get like huge. You'll get to a point where like what we missed is bigger than the rest of the series. Because be if, if we kept on doing things the same way we're doing them now, there'd be so much we miss out on. There'd be like a huge bump of what we missed episode at the end of every series. I mean, that's a way of doing it. Mm. But it would, yeah, I mean, it would just, what we missed would become so, so outside. Yeah. In its uh, relevancy to the rest. Mm. So... One idea that I've heard you kick around before, mm. and this is interesting. Uh, granted, once again, guys, this is a long way yeah. down the road. If, if anything, we'll get to a point, because we're going into the dark and middle ages, we're going to get to a point where like, we might need to do like 20 years of history in an episode, because the time periods aren't as sure we have as much history from that sort of time period. That, uh, that, that might not be the case, but yeah, it could go the other way. Like There could be not as much to talk about for a certain decade. So I think the important thing to establish here mm. off the bat is that there is not any desire to change the actual format of how you and I do business in terms of like in episode, how we converse, how we tell, oh, how totally. we relate the yeah. history. You know, this is this is a uh, this is talk history, as mm. I've, I've heard it termed before, which is as good a term as any. So that's not really so much the question, not. 80 history is not going to get turned on its head per se. No, it's more the structure. Like it's more, yes. it's more the time periods, the issue we're sort of thinking about. So for example, mm. how would you cover the forties? Well, I mean, to some degree you could do that year by year. Yeah. Um, and realistically still have so much you would want to cover, which is very difficult. And on top of that, and this is the other thing that I want to point out to you listening mm. or watching us is that, we are very interested if you have any suggestions. Totally, yeah. Please do tell us in any way, shape, form you can if you've got an idea of how you would like to see the podcast evolve and change its format in those sort of more as we adapt. years as we adapt and change, yeah. Because, you know, Patrick and I can't pretend to have all the answers by any means. And the fact of the matter is you listening or watching us right now may have a really good idea that has not dawned on us. Mm. So before we continue the rest of the conversation, what I will say is that if you do have a spark in terms of something like, hey, maybe these two could benefit from this, this might be cool. Mm. Of course, one of the best ways to do that, especially if you have a more detailed suggestion, I mean, don't don't blow us over with a treatise, but <laughs> be salient and, and very purposeful in your writing. That's that's always appreciated. And this comes from a guy who <laughs> has not learned his lesson in brevity. So I understand completely. However, of course, email us at 80historypodcast at tgnreview.com. Once again, that's 80historypodcast at tgnreview.com. Facebook.com slash 80historypodcast. Send us a message. Instagram.com slash 80historypodcast. Send us a message. 
Uh, I don't believe we have messages open on Twitter, but you can always tweet us an idea in the 240 characters, whatever it is now, which could be fine. But really, the email or the direct messages over on Facebook or Instagram. Mm. Of course, if you are watching on YouTube, put it down below. You know exactly the way to, that we'll end up seeing that, and that's something that we'd be very interested in hearing about. So, and if you're a patron, you, you know how to get a hold of us. Yeah. But ultimately, we are we are open to that. the The year to year one, I think, is interesting. On top of that, something though that I that could be a part of it, though, like I said, it, it would it would be more supplementary, I suppose, in a way. Is I do like how some of the kind of audio documentary stuff that we've done, that's, mm. that's kind of cool. That would be supplementary. That's that, a, yeah. that's, again, that's, it's not changing the format of the show, but it, it's us looking like, hey, hey, here's something really, really special in particular. That's, that's a really so good big. idea to do more of that in the future as well with more specific yeah. subjects. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all deviating from what you listening to us have come to enjoy so far by any means, but... For the most part, we're looking at all sorts of ideas without wholly changing the core concept yeah. of the show. And you suggested going down to doing an, a year of each episode as opposed to a decade. But what if we go further, Paul? What about if we do a month? Per, like when we get towards like the 20th century, what if we yeah, start it doing it into its own series? Yeah, we start doing like an episode for each month because that would definitely be out there and that would definitely be doable, I reckon, when we get to that sort of point in time like it's one yeah it's one of those things where in having this discussion with us right now you can see just how there are many unintended challenges that that crop up over time mm. that you don't you didn't really anticipate going into all of this mm. but ultimately it's something you need to address and uh, be open and creative about potential solutions. And even though it's a way off, I also think, of course, that there may be other ideas and concepts, obviously, that haven't dawned on us that we may end up just stumbling upon. You know what I mean? Just because you're, you're doing work and, and you realize you're, you're working on one element of the show at one point in time, and there's mm. some element of that that sparks like, hey, that could be an interesting permutation that could lead to addressing how we would ultimately choose to go about it. But yeah, year by year, month by month, there's, there's, so, there's so much there. Yeah, I like... can definitely tell you this, something that I would and do very much want to get mm. to when that time comes, especially because there's going to be so much more there going on, is I definitely will be quite aggressive in terms of getting more uh, specialized guests. Yeah, that'd be really good to have more specialized guests in for those sort of occasions. Where we can do some really fantastic long-form interviews with mm. people that are, well, it's what they do. And you and I, you know, asking the questions we ask and, and having uh, really fantastic conversations about that. Mm. I am a very big fan of that. Also, something that has happened in the past that I really appreciate from time to time, we'll get emails from viewers or listeners that have suggested guests for our show. And I always love getting those emails because even if for whatever reason it doesn't end up working out because there's so many reasons that something like that can end up working out or not, you still always really appreciate it. And it can always open up a new line of thinking and mm. information that we really appreciate having because once again we don't have all the answers but those of you that have taken the time out to do that sort of thing in the past thank you yeah uh this is very much kind of in the same ballpark as it were but outside of that like i said very much on the guest side of things some more of that supplementary material but one way or another we're gonna have to find a way to yeah to boil it down and and make some the truth of the matter is some very difficult choices yeah totally like what would we talk about and something else i another idea i had we could carry on doing episodes by decade but just do multiple episodes so we would have 
three episodes on the 40s because that seems to be when we're using as an example for obvious reasons we could have an episode like we could literally so three different it would be like six a subjects really good we'd idea. cover all together so like one episode on the yeah, it could be literally be yeah it could be kind of how we do it now, but multiple episodes i think we've done it in the past we had like a we had i think it was during the crisis we had the appendices episode for one decade where it kind of spilled into yeah, two. yeah. We could do something because Aurelian like that. dominated the first half of that decade. Yeah, and then the other half was kind of um, was kind of a loose end, and yeah. you wanted to to get in. That's a really good idea. You could even do it by geography. Yeah. as well. No, definitely. So say something like World War Two, the forties. You could have an episode where we each so we have an a an a, a, you have like an Americas episode where we cover events from the Americas a Europe episode and an Asia episode to give it a vague example of what was happening in each part of the world. But even then, that sounds so daunting for the 40s as well. It is. Yeah. It, it is. There's, there's, as far as I can tell right now, there doesn't seem to be something that would at least denote in my mind as a, as a perfect solution. Mm. However, there's one other thing, though, that I think should definitely be a part of this. And this is the first time will have used this particular term publicly. Mm. Uh, and it will certainly, because you and I have discussed it behind the scenes as well. And if you are listening or watching on YouTube, obviously this would be something that would have a great deal of interest to you in all likelihood. Mm. And that is also working in a live streaming app. Totally, yeah. We do want to go live one day. It. it it's such an alien thing to me live streaming it's something i've only very tepidly dipped my toes into in the past i'd love to look into it more as well, a viewer yeah. and a creator i ought to say sure yeah i would say over the last year mm. i've become a much bigger fan yeah of live streaming than i had been previously especially for live streams that are a bit smaller Mm -hmm. where there's a lot more interaction with you who is watching us, where you may have a comment or a question and we can see it and we can answer mm. your question or comment in real time. I think that's cool. And on top of that, in addition to the fact that, and this is not us getting off topic, this is a very specific reason why I bring this up. One is, in general, they've made live streaming a lot easier to do. Mm. And now and so much of this having to do with you who have supported us on Patreon and 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 so so graciously to be sure we have ways of doing it now where we can do it in very nice quality yeah. so that you watching us or listening to us on YouTube can get the best experience of that mm. and so even though i going live will it would certainly happen long before this I do want there to be a, a live streaming element to yeah, it. Yeah, I think that'd be a great thing to do, do some live streaming stuff in the future. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a lot of fun. I've seen it done very well. Mm. And it just, it's fun for you and I as creators, and it's a lot of fun for you as listeners or, or viewers because you see stuff that's pre-recorded and, you know, we take our time to make sure we put out a good show, but there's nothing quite like the experience of being live mm. and on top of that because the reason i bring this up is because i would want there to be a lot of open and interesting discussions especially when we start getting to periods of time where many of us have even actual human connections to the yeah. periods of time we're talking about i mean you even look at family histories i know part of your family comes from malta yeah Part of my family obviously comes from Southern Italy. Those are both places, for example, that were profoundly affected by the Second World War. Hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of elements to it that I like, but I do like the concept of having the various appendices on a particular hmm. decade where this this own like mini volume. Totally, like yeah, I'm up for that idea as well. I think live streaming is a great place for us to go with it. But I think something we need to ask us is when would we uh, integrate these changes because my guts is the 20th century but could it be sooner do you think it could be later like it would be sooner than that i think yeah do you think especially so? when you i mean you think about something imagine covering 
is a ways off now. Hmm. Imagine covering the history of the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, 1500s. That, that, that's, you know, by and large, sort of the 15th, 16th century. That's yeah. when we get into the modern age that we're still into today. That could be a place. You know, that's when, that's even when the US, that's when your homeland is going to start being a very pivotal uh, player in our story yeah. as well, Paul. It could possibly be way earlier than, in my head it was always 20th century, but it could definitely be way earlier than that. Yeah, because you start seeing historical events that have truly global mm. context and, and consequence. It's when our world really starts to become more global. We figured out the whole globe basically by that point. Yeah, and you know, mastering the age of sail. Mm. I mean, granted, communication was delayed, but all the same, there's a lot of global consequence to mm. all of that. My guess is that one the material will indicate to us without a doubt when it's time no doubt yeah because we'll, we'll see it and we'll say to yourselves oh boy we know that both as students of history and presenters of history that there's just some stuff that cannot go ignored or no. just be a mere footnote it's still gonna be a while oh yeah thankfully but i definitely wanted to get the conversation rolling on this and I think for myself, Paul, a lot of my episodes of AD History begin with the Wikipedia page for the decade we're studying. Um, it's a window. It's a, it's a great window. And right now, those Wikipedia pages are relatively small. But when we get to like the Wikipedia page for the 40s, we've been like 1540s, 1530s, however sort of thing you want to do. Those Wikipedia pages are going to get mahusive. Like it's definitely going to have to come to a point where we're like, we're going to have to be a bit more yeah they they, they become they become living works unto themselves they're yeah. they're really quite interesting to peer in at from time to time you know they're 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 a window you know that's, that's the mm. best way to describe it so i would imagine probably i can't imagine that it would happen later than say the 16th century perhaps no but all in all We'll we'll certainly know when the need arises, without a doubt. But if I were to guess, it's going to be somewhere in that in that five hundred year home stretch there. Mm. Yeah, which is going to be quite a stretch to say the least. Well, like it it kind of does stretch out the goalpost even longer. Like, just when you think you're getting to the goalpost, we stretch oh, yeah. it a bit further. I think that's really great as well to keep this keep keep it going. Yes, absolutely. So. This is us opening up the conversation mm. and giving you some insight into how we kick it around when we're behind closed doors and we're thinking, hey, we see something that's coming up. It may not be particularly soon, but it's going to happen. And that this is just kind of how the process works over time. And we know that you have some very good ideas and suggestions so email them to us at 80 history podcast at tgnreview.com once again that's 80 history podcast at tgnreview.com facebook.com slash 80 history podcast instagram.com slash 80 history podcast be sure to send us a message like I said, it doesn't have to be a treatise but certainly brevity is appreciated but all the same so are your recommendations or anytime you have a recommended guest or something of that nature that's all a really great stuff because we love hearing from you. But back to the beginning here, we have a long way to go in figuring that out. So we definitely want to hear from you. But since this is the Patreon submitted question, Patrick, segment, mm. how can you listening or watching help AD History on Patreon? You can go to www.patreon.com forward slash AD History Podcast and go support us there. Of course, it gives you access to uh, giving us questions to uh, for us to answer in the middle of our episodes. But there's so much more than that on there. There are exclusive early access to episodes of the podcast that have special director's cuts. We add some extra additional information. Sometimes it's just sort of silly back and forth between me and Paul. Sometimes it's whole big conversations. They're exclusively for patrons to hear. But there's way more than that as well. We have our patron-exclusive episodes, Best of BC. 
There's currently one of those out there at the moment, Paul, but we're definitely going to start making another one soon. Yeah, those are a lot of fun. Yeah, to they're really yeah. fun. So while we're here, we talk about AD history. Best of BC is our chance to highlight some of the more notable events that happened before the start of our podcast, the best of BC. Uh, it's really great fun, really good to make. That's all waiting for you over on the Patreon. It is a fantastic way to support the show. Even through my work with Name Explain, I use Patreon a lot. I love Patreon as a platform, as a concept. I think it's a fantastic way to support the creators you love. Because when you support a creator on Patreon, it means they don't have to worry about certain other things in life. They don't have to worry about following trends and trying to get views and clicks. They know that their content is being funded by people who love the content for what it is. And I, Amen. Yeah, and I genuinely think there's something super special about that. I will, I will beat the drummer Patreon until the day I die. I, I think it's a terrific platform. And if you want to go help support uh, AD History on Patreon, please do consider it. Just go check it out for yourself. See if it interests you by any means. It's, it's a great time there. It certainly is. And a couple other things worth noting mm. here. One is, if you can't do a reoccurring on a monthly basis, we do have one-time donation options. We do mm. have a special 80 History Podcast PayPal link, which if you're on YouTube, you can find it in the About page or the description down below on the episode itself. Also on YouTube, we are accepting super thanks. Now, yeah, this, this is, is something... very easy, straightforward way to do it. Yeah, I still need to figure that out myself. They've, I think they've just become accessed here in the UK as well, and I need to figure them out for name explain. Yeah, they're, they're, they really are fantastic. So... There's also those one-time donation options, and if you ever want to send a note to us in it, like, for example, on the one-time PayPal donation, mm. you can always write a little message if you want to say something to us there, because we'll definitely read it, and we definitely appreciate it. But we know times are hard, and that it's not always possible to donate on a reoccurring basis or even a one-time basis. We understand that. Mm. But if you are a big fan of the 80 History Podcast and you do want to support the show, if you have not done so already, on your podcast or a podcatcher of choice, be sure to leave a five-star rating and glowing review. It helps people better understand the show. It lets us know, as the creators, as the host, what your thoughts are on what we are doing and why you enjoy or in some cases... Why you might not be enjoying it, but certainly on the more positive side, we most appreciate that, to be sure. And it's available on Apple Podcasts, of course. Spotify has just integrated it. There's no written review section, mm. but it is a scale of one to five stars, where I believe the listener on that account has to have listened to the show for a minimum of 30 minutes, so they want to get as accurate a rating as possible. Of course, I believe it's also available on Audible if you're interested in that audiobook service, which if you are a longtime listener of AD History, you know Patrick and I both adore. Mm -hmm. That's available there on the individual episode. It's there for the entire show, both rating and review. And another one that is really important, and I've seen several listeners of ours go and do, is on Podchaser.com. Podchaser.com is the IMDb of podcasting where mm. in addition to listening to the show there if you so wish you can leave individual rating and reviews not just for each episode but for the show in general some of you have gone and done that followed us there left glowing ratings and reviews we read that it mm. helps people find the show it certainly helps us show up more favorably and rank higher in any sort of search that's going on it lets other people know what the show is all about and it helps us in ways that are truly immense and that as creators, we can see that impact immeasurably. So if you're not able to donate, donate a few kind words and a few minutes of your time, rate and review mm. the show because it goes such a long way. But we'd like to thank you as always for donating to the 80 History Podcast for those patrons who have done so, those who have left glowing ratings, and reviews because we are incredibly thankful for them. But we'll be back in a moment because we're going to get into the final chapter of the Visigoth King Alaric I, who goes on and sacks Rome, the Italian peninsula, and leaves such a 
incredible mark on history that I do not think you will want to miss in this upcoming segment. So, us here, you there. And we'll be back right after a word from one. AD! This is the AD History Podcast. So, Paul, I believe I'm not mistaken, you're carrying on uh, your conversation from last time about Alaric and his invasion of Italy. So, let's continue that story, shall we? Absolutely. And this is an incredible story in a lot of different ways, because for all intents and purposes in the past, the Roman peninsula has been threatened. They fought wars that have made it well onto the way of the peninsula. But this is by far one of the most devastating. Mm. And last time where we left off, a lark was about to launch his first campaign into the Italian peninsula. So do we know why he invaded? Like, What exactly was his motives behind all this? That's a bit ambiguous. Mm. There's no unequivocal source that explicitly states why Alar chose to make this move. We can only make some educated extrapolations as to what his motives were. Mm. And in this case, as we have seen so far, much of what Alaric had done has been in response to a lack of Roman recognition and reward for the service he and the Goths had performed for Rome. Though it's still hard to necessarily ascertain all of his motives, or what the strategic may have benefit, his strategic benefit might have been as he saw it, that forced him to make this move and, and roll the iron dice. So we've talked about before this whole great migration we saw in the uh, 370s, how this was just a naturally occurring thing. So was this just part of that, or was this a more tactical military move, or was it just part of this migration that was happening anyway? So from what I understand, mm. this does not appear to be a continuation of the Goths' great migration to the Danube and into the mm. Empire like we saw in the 370s and eventually the settlement after continuous military conflicts in the early 380s. Mm. Alark's ranks, for all we know, were comprised of the young, the ambitious, and those who never quite successfully cut their teeth in farming themselves, Okay, specifically within the land grant they received from Rome prior. Now the interesting thing is the timing. The timing of a lark for this invasion into the Italian peninsula was in many regards extremely opportunistic. That opportunity being that Stilicho was then heavily engaged in fighting with what is roughly considered today as modern Austria. Hence, the initial opposition to Alaric and what he experienced by Roman forces was actually very little. And indeed, it allowed him to eventually besiege Milan in full. By the time of 402, Milan had taken on a much greater political importance compared to Rome itself. Though in 402, and largely with this decade in general, much of the political leadership were spending even more time, in fact, most of their time, in a place known as Ravenna. So why Ravenna then? So we've obviously talked about mm. Ravenna before, but not necessarily from this perspective. There are a number of possibilities why they were spending more time there, but one of the largest reasons I found consistently was that it presented the ability to be defended and very well at that, because Ravenna enjoyed being surrounded by thick marshlands on basically three quarters of its size. So basically mm. one true way in and one true way out. And that's terrain that even a, a modern mechanized force would not wish to encounter no. if they had any other choice. Like, for example, during Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, the first initial advance and the way it worked out was that they had to go around a large swath of northern Ukraine and, and southern Belarus that's known as the Pripyat Marshes mm. because they're just it's just such an impossible you know, impassable and difficult terrain in an in actually a very timely way. So you don't want to experience it that, but the isolation is also a double edged sword, naturally, because it provides a wonderful natural barrier to defend the city. Yet it doesn't do much for finding covert ways to sustain a prolonged siege with external means, if you kind of follow what I'm saying here. Mm. So, double-edged sword, to be sure. 
Stilko did eventually manage to extricate himself from the fighting in that general Austrian area and engaged the Goth, Ar Goth army under a lark as many as four times, up to three in the proximity of Milan and a fourth battle near Verona. But despite that, it apparently did not result in a conclusive and decisive victory against Alark. And Alark himself did not come out of this unscathed, especially personally. Stilco actually managed to capture Alark's wife and son. Hmm, my gosh. Not, so that's, that, that's worth having, I suppose, in war. It, th there's definitely value to it, yeah. to be sure. But... You know, anytime you try to engage in these pitch battles and you don't get a decisive victory, hmm. it is a it is a terrible price that you have to pay for gaining so little. Hmm. Oh, but gotcha. following these, but following these engagements with Stilico, Alark did end up making a withdrawal back into the Balkans. The history is not entirely clear as to why he chose to step back at this point, but many have concluded that the most plausible reason was due to issues of lacking supplies for further sustained effort with his army. So was there benefits to returning with his forces to the Balkans? Is that a land area he was familiar with at all by any chance? I mean, it was Roman still at that point, surely? Yes. So mm. here's the interesting thing about the Balkans in this very specific period in time. Yeah. The Balkans presented a unique opportunity for Alaric and the mm -hmm. Goths in general that were under his command. It was something of a no man's land in oh, regards okay, to control by either the western or eastern halves of the empire. Of course, it was right slapping in the middle, wasn't it? I guess. Yeah. It's like the gateway yeah. to Turkey. With neither side having the effective means to mm. exert effective control there, Alaric could and did remain there for several years rebuilding his army, marshalling supplies from various settlements in the Balkans, which he's mm -hmm. done before, and let events present him a new opportunity to move forward with his then unfulfilled ambitions. And by 405, mm -hmm. Stilco was actually quite willing to negotiate with Alaric and make some significant concessions to him. And he had some very specific motivations for mm. doing so, but we'll get those in a bit. Most importantly, and this is something that we discussed prior, he agreed to give Alaric the thing that Alaric had been going for for so long, which is that a formal title of Master of Soldiers, as I believe we discussed previously. Yeah. Alaric coveted that title because it entitled him to a large share of food and general supplies for his army on the dime found in the Roman purse. Fantastic. But, <laughs> yes, but the story isn't done yeah, yet. Yeah. But this concession was controversial at best, specifically within the leadership of the Eastern Empire. And the reason I say that is... Well, yes, it had some to do with Alaric himself. More importantly, it was much more of an internal Roman problem. They were none too pleased to be dictated to by Stilicho. Mm. They didn't want him calling the shots. Hence, they rejected this settlement out of hand, such as it counted, their rejection counted for anything practically. But over the next two years... A lark exercise would appear to be one of his greatest and least recognized virtues. Patience. He would watch and wait for what was to come. And then later in Philip 405, Stilicho was forced to deal with a major invasion by the Goths under King Radagaisus, reaching as far south as northern Italy. While there are claims that Radagaisus' forces totaled upwards of 400,000 troops, many scholars find that total to be ridiculously high. Unbelievably high for mm. a number of reasons. Yeah, but Stilco, to his credit, was able to summon a commensurate fighting force to meet this invasion by Radagaisus. While the scope of forces for both sides seems to have been exaggerated in their totals over time, what is not an exaggeration is how major the victory Stilicho achieved against these Goths. Mm. 
And this is a really interesting point, and I credit it to Adrian Goldsworthy, where apparently it is said that due to the victory by Stilico and on the scope in which he managed to achieve it, the number of captured enemies was so great, it immediately brought down the market price of slaves in the immediate aftermath significantly. Gosh, I buy like supply and demand, this most barbaric form, I suppose. There was way Absolutely. too much supply and not enough demand because there were slaves going willy nilly at this time. My God, they what? absolutely flooded the market My in, in insofar as goodness. that particular, you know, tr- that particular practice was it's, engaged in. It's barbaric to think of slavery as a commodity in the same way of gold or cars or whatever you can buy and sell but that's unfortunately how these people were treated so i guess the only thing i mean is it good or bad to be an unwanted slave like does that give you more freedom or less slave freedom i have no idea but what a strange time it is indeed yeah fascinating and you, you said this invasion force was gothic and did it include any forces from the ranks of alaric very good question mm. To my knowledge, these Goths were entirely separate from any contribution made by Alaric or his forces. Mm. Insofar as I can tell, this Gothic campaign under Redegysus was entirely independent of Alaric and his army. Mm. Now, this is where things start getting interesting on the internal side of things, which is to say the constant shifting sands of imperial leadership in the empire, specifically the Western one. Mm. And between 405 and 407, the Western empire in particular was undergoing another spasmodic episode of usurpation, (laughs) almost entirely originating from Britain. Mm -hmm. Specifically that of Constantine, who crossed the channel in early 407, that would go on to control most of Gaul and Hispania for a time himself. This was precisely the opportunity Alaric had been biding his time and was looking to exploit. Hence, in 407, Alaric went marching back into the Italian peninsula with a litany of unfinished business on his agenda. And before we go any further, mm. it's this, this is what I was referring to in regards to what Stilicho had in mind when he negotiated that peace with Alaric that ended his invasion, which is, say, when he was mm. willing to negotiate him a little later, later on when that campaign ended, mm. he saw in giving those terms to Alaric an opportunity for Alaric to eventually go and contribute to fighting Constantine. So that's another little thing in all of this that's worth pointing out. So you mentioned Alaric's back on the scene. He's come marching back to Italy. What were his aims yeah. this time around? So that that's interesting. Mm. This is where Alaric was clearly prepared to fight if necessary, which is what you have to do because mm. anytime, even if you're seeking a long-term negotiation, you can only negotiate from a position of power or else mm. it's not a negotiation. They're ultimatums, right? Mm. It does appear in the second campaign invasion of the Italian peninsula that Alaric was far more interested in coercing Stilicho, who was then in a serious dilemma. Mm. With the forces of Constantine from Britannia, essentially in very large control, very large swaths of Gaul and Hispania, Mm. Alaric figured he could extort a large sum of valuables to call off his Mm. carefully timed and executed invasion. Alaric was open to calling off his campaign if, if Stilicho would pay Alaric the lump sum of 4,000 pounds of gold. <laughs> that's no that's, small amount, my that's friend. That's a lot of gold. No small amount. That's a lot it of is. gold. This created the following dilemma for Stilicho. One. He could refuse the demands of Alaric and split the necessary concentration of his forces in order to fight both Alaric and Constantine simultaneously. Or two, he could accept Alaric's terms, free Stilicho's forces to deal 
with Constantine forces in concentrated fashion, but have to deal with the political fallout from the wealthy sources needed to raise mm. such a large sum in short order in order to meet a large demand. So basically like wealthy merchants, senators, mm. that kind of thing. Stilicho ended up choosing option number two. Mm -hmm. And it created a rather notable discord between him and those who had to try and pony up that sum on the fly. Yeah, like, <laughs> takes a lot to ask that much, for that much money all of a sudden from some people. And this comes <laughs> to an interesting point, mm. Patrick, something that's very much worth discussing, and it's applicable in any type of conflict you can imagine. Mm. And that is the difference between creating problems okay. versus creating dilemmas, hmm. okay? To Alaric's credit, he created a distinct dilemma for Stilicho at this point, and brilliantly so. It is important, though, to understand the difference between the two and why they're so significant and potentially beneficial to anybody creating them in a conflict. Problems. A problem can be reasonably defined as a challenge where there is a solution, perhaps a number of good solutions, hmm. singular in nature, a problem. A dilemma is very different. A dilemma is creating numerous problems where none of the alternatives are good alternatives and come at a considerable cost of the other priorities depending on how one chooses to address the matters at hand. That's really so, fascinating. Yeah, so if mm. you have if you choose option number 1 in order to prioritize whatever it might be, mm. the other major priorities that you also are looking to address will then suffer as well. Mm. And there are so many times in history, certainly in military history, but this is true of political infighting whatever the case may be, that when you're creating dilemmas for your opposition, that is one of the crucial means by which to eventually achieve victory mm. because if there's no great options and you choose one and several other will suffer and the consequences are very clear and the costs are very high that is the perfect dilemma to mm. create in this case so let's give you like a quick example say you're looking to make a tactical withdrawal mm. you're on the defensive and you know if you do it you can say you have to leave all of your fighting equipment behind, but you'll save the vast majority of your human capital in terms of forces mm. by doing so. Or you can stay, stick it out, and you might be able to repel it, or you can end up getting destroyed altogether. You see mm. kind of where I'm going with Totally, this. yeah, yeah. Whereas a singular problem is, like I said, singular. You can find various solutions where, in, in other cases, other priorities do not suffer mm. in the same way. So this form of appeasement by Stilicho to Alaric was a political death blow to Stilicho. Between a mutiny of his own forces that were ready to invade Gaul and repel Constantine, and the growing resentment by Honorus for what he saw as being marginalized by Stilicho's hand, it was game over mm. for Stilicho. All of his closest allies in Coterie were arrested and executed in Ravenna. And he ended up surrendering without a fight and was executed himself. Yes, we talked about which this is really, a little yeah, bit with my that's segment. interesting. You'd think mm. uh, uh, from everything we saw, you figure he would go down fighting. But in this case, he, he gave up. I don't know if it was out of a sense of some kind of honor or duty to Rome or he was just simply exhausted. Yeah. It's impossible to know. He actually did mm. take sanctuary for a time in a church, mm. and then ultimately came out, surrendered under the condition that he wouldn't be executed. But you know what? You can't negotiate from a position of weakness. So right. when he did surrender himself and he left that sanctuary of the church, he was executed. <laughs> of course. If memory serves from my research instead of Cho, still okay. He was popular with the people for some time, but that popularity just waned and it wasn't he wasn't valuable to Rome anymore. Not mm. not certainly not the people who managed to 
marshal the power to get rid of them. You mm. know, you can't do that. You can't survive in this just real blood sport. Mm. So most of his allies were killed, including himself, and his son was hunted down later. But those who did survive mm. this bloodletting, actually a great number of them ended up defecting to Alaric. Mm. If you can believe that. <laughs> These Ro Gosh. otherwise Roman forces, you know? Wanted to be with Alaric, like the enemy. So he goes down without a fight. Mm. And in his absence, which is say his death, mm. <laughs> a very influential, albeit for a short time, civil servant kind of became very present inside Honoris's court. A man by the name of Olympias. And oh, what a name. Yeah. What a name. Terrific name. He would definitely exercise a great deal of influence in the ear of the young honors, who I think was only in his early 20s at yeah. this point. Stilicho's fall created a situation where Honoris refused to honor the terms that Stilicho had negotiated with Alaric of the 4,000 pounds of gold. Mm. This is not a huge surprise, especially considering how politically toxic that became very, very quickly, mm. because they went through all sorts of ways to try to pony up that money, including ultimately, you know, pawning off a great deal of public works in Rome, mm. in addition to like trying to reach into the pockets of the wealthiest class, senators, merchants. You remember my telling you this earlier. Yes, yeah. So it was basically politically impossible for him to do it. The issue here was that while Honoris and company were prepared to refuse payment and not negotiate with Alaric further, they were by no means ready for the invariable consequences of that decision which was a second very large invasion by Alaric and his Goths. Moreover, with the significant purge that, you know, for those who are still living, as I mentioned earlier, they went over to Alaric's lines, which you have to imagine was actually quite a benefit. Mm. You know, you're dealing with a very experienced, very professional army, both officers, higher-ups, lower, lower down in the ranks. Very beneficial. Mm which is interesting. So in this case, Alaric finally began to march to Rome itself based on the fact that there was no negotiation and they were not going to uphold the terms that yeah. Stilicho had negotiated previously. And so he went even deeper into the Italian peninsula than he had the first time. Indeed, it was reported that he reached Rome with little to no Gosh. resistance. It's mad. It is. Alaric, in fact, began besieging Rome in the winter of 408 into 409. Moreover, Alaric managed to accomplish a significant strategic feat in his siege of Rome. He captured and cut off the port of Portus, which mm. was the principal logistical hub that facilitated the vast majority of Rome's food supplies, as well as most any other commerce you can imagine. Mm. He was seeking to lock this city down. Mm. The siege did have the desired initial effect, interestingly enough, as the Roman brain trust in Ravenna signaled a desire to negotiate again and negotiate they did, though as quickly as the negotiations began, they soon fell apart in a matter of months, many mm. have claimed, each side blaming the other for how and why these negotiations ultimately failed. The whole situation was very poorly executed by Olympias in general, being at that right mm. hand of Honorus. He would not grant, yet again, Alaric's long-cherished post of Master of Soldiers, while at the same time losing political credibility by apparently various concessions that he did grant to him. So he didn't do enough to get Alaric to stop, but he went far enough where he was totally discredited personally, then basically went and fled the coop and put himself into self-imposed exile. As you can imagine, Alaric was becoming very tired of this rather pathetic and otherwise incoherent tactics of the Romans by this point. This led to a rather lengthy political scheme where Alaric for a time appointed the prefect of Rome, Priscus Attalus, the new empire. Mm -hmm. This was done so Alaric could be granted the title of master soldiers by Attalus, but the move was altogether ineffectual and eventually abandoned in a short period of time mm. thereafter. With the continued recalcitrance of Honoris and company in Ravenna, Alaric stopped playing games altogether. He had spent too much time and had received too little not to take more drastic steps 
to achieve his aims. Mm. More than anything, he needed to provide tangible spoils for his army who had to endure this garbage for quite some time. This is when the hammer fell. Mm. A lark was going to make the city of Rome the spoils for his loyal forces. That's a big deal. As we've talked about before, Rome hadn't really been sacked up until this point, and if it had been, it was a mythological sacking way back when. And so mm. the infamous date is either 22 or 23 August of 410. Mm. When Alaric issued the order to begin sacking Rome, the first three days were apparently the most noteworthy. From what we can tell, they were welcomed openly. They did throw open the gates. Mm. But where so much of the pillaging of the vast ancient metropolis took place, it, it's really quite incredible. Rome wasn't the same grandiose capital as we have come no. to know it in our show so far. No, at all. But it was a considerable prize for a plundering army, on top of the fact the population had come down as well. But it was no joke. And what is unique, though, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough, and I know you listening or watching right now, wherever you are listening or watching, will find this as interesting as I did and especially when we begin to speculate as to why. Hmm. What is unique about the sacking of Rome in this case is what was left alone, untampered, unmolested. Apparently, Alaric handed down strict orders that Christian churches were not to be touched and all priests, nuns, or clergy were to be unharmed. This is fascinating. It is. Surely because... This can be interpreted in a number of ways. But when you sit down and crunch out the political equation, mm. one can reasonably conclude that Alaric saw no benefit to crossing the church itself. The church is surely not an enemy one would welcome, as it would likely make any future ambitions he may have had mm. much harder well, to achieve. From what research I did on this matter in a segment of mine, I came across the thought that Alaric was of the same Christian religion as the Romans. So thought, hey, that's uh, this might be Rome, but it's still Christian. I'm Christian. I don't want to do that. And that's that. That's the conclusion I came to on the matter. I think there's definitely truth to this, mm. but I think there's also a more real politic reason for it as well. Okay. Okay. So, I think you are correct. Mm. But let's look. Let's take this a little bit further in terms of down the line, what would be the consequences of doing this? And the interesting thing about the church, mm. even though it, in later centuries, obviously, they were able to do a multitude of things that they weren't able to do at this point where they could exert their, mm. uh, the church could exert itself more martially. If you cross the church and you sack churches and you kill clergy or whatever the case may mm. be, the church has such an influence that it would turn this from just your a war as we understand war mm. to something where you have an example of how these little bits here are so incredibly important. So let me, let me explain why. Say you go and you destroy the church and you, you, know, you rip apart the clergy, you take all the prizes that are to be had. And in doing so, say word gets out about that, right? Say word gets out about that. There's one thing at this point where, yeah, okay, we have loyalty to Rome, but when you start getting into the Christians identifying with hmm. the church and acting and resisting on behalf of the church by someone you see as outwardly attacking the church, hmm. you make so many enemies that even if they don't hold a sword, or even if they are no way military, you can basically create a, a, a martyr, as mm. it were, and you can become enemy number one, where the struggle goes from being military and geopolitical and everything that goes with that to something that is much more high-minded in defense of your religion, in defense of your faith that even as a commoner Christian, 
you would look at that those actions and say they are my enemy because they are an enemy to my God hmm. and my religion, and you'll find various ways of resisting them that make a large job down the line, hypothetically, a lot harder to achieve. There's a great little story. I believe it happened in Yalta, so February mm. of 1945. Maybe it was in 44. The, the, the three big three were talking, and somebody brought up the position of where the Catholic Church sits in all of this mm. because naturally they were a big player in World War II. That, you know, there's a lot of controversy that goes with that, but essentially you know mm. what I mean. That's, it, was, it was still a big deal. And Stalin asked you know, in kind of a mocking rhetorical fashion, how many divisions does the Pope command? <laughs> now, think about that statement for a moment. From an actual military prowess point of view, mm. at least certainly at that time in 45, they did not have military forces. No. But they had moral and theological credibility mm. and importance where if the church called for something to say resist or do x y and z it could potentially mobilize entire populations that belong to the church and worship in the church against whatever the transgression and those who did it were so it becomes in a sense something of a holy war so you follow my yeah, thinking here yeah like it's just yeah yeah i get that it's that ability to command the loyalty of those who believe in the faith, even if they don't hold a sword. They're highly influential. You don't want to get on the bad side of someone with a lot of influence. Exactly. So yeah. while the Pope didn't command any division, no, no. If he it, definitely had the direct ear and influence of millions. If you, and you don't want to yeah. cross that. If you upset the Pope, you're upset in what, like 1.3 billion Catholics? How many people are Catholic on this planet? Yes. Yeah. And in this case, I'm sure that's that that was in play here. Mm. On top of the fact, it would have also kind of worked into Roman propaganda, which is say only a barbarian would do this. Mm. Only a barbarian would do this. So that's part of how I'm thinking. So I think mm. there's definitely him in the Christian camp, but at the same time, you know, he did not want a holy war on his hands wherever no. he went. No, 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 no. Okay. You have to imagine. Yeah, that. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. The other thing that's interesting here is because while the sacking of Rome destroyed any possibility of a lark negotiating a peace on equal terms with Honorus going forward, honestly, it matters very little. Shortly following the plunder that could satiate any degree of avarice, a lark would still, interestingly enough, not too long after this, end up dying. Mm -hmm. But even though the negotiations were made politically untenable after sacking Rome, and while he got more plunder and booty for his men than you could possibly ever need or imagine, what he wanted to do from there is he wanted to take his forces hmm. and transport them by sea to North Africa because he wanted to set up a new base of power where there would be ample food, grain, and supplies. Hmm. And so after Rome was then sacked and they got more than they could possibly imagine, Yeah, the weather that year ended up destroying most of the flotilla that he managed to marshal in order to do that. And then shortly thereafter, he died. Oh. He died. But he left a hell of a legacy. You know, the first person to sack Rome, the city of Rome itself. Like, that's a hell of a legacy. Is the first, like, the first some major blow to Western Rome at this point, uh, where it stands in world history at this time. And he played oh, a yeah, damn important absolutely... role in all that. His name's in the history books for a reason. There's no question about it. Mm. So a, a Roman-trained Goth who would come on to later sack Rome itself. And so what are the lessons here that we're learning about Rome at this point and mm. how it seems that we're really putting together some of the, the final building blocks mm. that end formally the Western Empire? And one is obviously the political you know, turmoil mm. that's happening in the Western Empire is basically making it impossible to act in any sort of coherent fashion. 
I can't. They're their own worst enemy. I can't even imagine what it's like, Paul, to have a string of useless leaders. Who, who can imagine what that feels oh, like boy, in regular yeah, succession? You know, I, <laughs> it really leaves one to wonder. It's just in, incredible stuff. You know, it's it's unthinkable. Mm-hmm. Unthinkable at this day unthinkable. and age. Something uh, I found interesting with this, you mentioned how Alaric was Gothic, trained by Romans, but to then turn on Rome. And he wasn't the only one. You said a lot of uh, other Romans sort of joined Alaric's side. If Rome just kept their troops in the good books better, gave them more respect, could this have all have been avoided? If they kept Alaric happy, would he have ever turned on Rome in the first place? Okay, so there's a few things going on here. Mm. As far as actual troops that are on the ground fighting, mm. the respect, well, what they considered respect was tangible benefit yes so could have rome that's, give a more tangible benefit respect. yeah could rome have done more of that as far as a lark is concerned mm. had they actually followed through and given him this post that he consistently again and again and again mm. looked to get that master of soldiers could this all have been avoided and that's an unanswerable question because it's a historical counterfactual mm. Though it definitely created far more problems, it would seem, than it would have simply giving him that title and sticking by it, making him an asset as opposed to an unnecessary enemy. Because they knew what he wanted, presumably, and again and again and again, they don't follow through in you know, basically meeting his one core demand, which in the short term may have been expensive, but in the long term... Based on what happened, the cost of that and the consequences of that would have been pennies on the dollar. Absolute Hmm. pennies on the dollar. And so between this absolutely incoherent leadership, which we've seen fighting itself consistently for a couple hundred years now, it's amazing that they've even made it this far in in some sort of way that is recognizable as a single, or in this case two, distinct related political entities. But it's so clear, and I know we've said this before, but it's so clear that the way this has gone, their greatest enemy has not been an external No. It has not been an external existential threat. That hasn't been the case for a very long time. It's all been inside their borders. eating itself from the inside. And in many respects, Patrick... Mm. They have been for a very long time with very few exceptions, and those exceptions being genuinely stellar, truly, genuinely their own worst enemy. Definitely. And this just continues to spiral out of control to the point where Rome itself, even if it's not as important as it had been, Mm. had been sacked. Yeah. It had been outright sacked. And I find that just utterly galling and not incomprehensible but talk about a tremendous mm. lack of vision it was only and i know it's impossible to see the future but come on you can be more prudent than this it was only a few years ago you and i paul were talking about the pax romana and this heyday of rome and in the grand scheme of it was that a few centuries ago now like how did it turn so quickly for rome i've actually con- i was considering this very question mm that what here is the big difference between the early empire where our show began Mm. and the folks and events that we're dealing with now and have been dealing with for a couple hundred years. Mm. And I think the real strength here compared, you know, as far as comparing the early empire to what we're dealing with now is that Rome of the earlier imperial period was far more tact, you know, tactically and strategically flexible Mm. not just militarily but politically which is to say that in order to bring people in to the fold they were willing to grant certain autonomy and honors and powers to a variety of non-latin roman communities and leaders that were within their border that just seems ultimately satiating that themselves now like if we talked about mm. way at the beginning when you encountered the romans you know that was the easy way but they had no issue with doing it the hard way and so they were much more open 
to granting some of these honors, some of these this autonomy in exchange for their loyalty and the understanding that Rome does hold the big whip hand, but it doesn't need to get to that point. They've lost that entirely here, mm. really in any meaningful fashion outside of, outside of you know, like short-term necessities that will come up and come go. So I, I guess it really comes down to this idea. This is an interesting idea in political science. What is the more dangerous thing? A, a nation, obviously this is not within the nation state, but it's mm. a civilization, it's a great power. What's more dangerous? A, a great power that believes it is strong or a great power that sees itself as weak and vulnerable? And for me, oftentimes that conclusion, there's no definite conclusion, it can change, but I do find this to generally play out to be the case, is that those powers that consider them in, themselves strong and in a strong position are usually much more flexible in terms of granting concessions and being able to, to give some and take some, whereas a power that sees itself as weak and more to the point sees itself as vulnerable is going to take more drastic actions that can lead to horrific consequences. I'm curious where you fall on this one. I think, like you said, an empire that knows it's weak is it, it's somewhat strong because you're taking responsibility for your actions. You're understanding there's something wrong. And if you understand you're weak and defenseless, you can think, okay, well, what can we do to change it? If you just go along thinking you're in power and you're great still, you're not really learning anything. You're opening yourself up to attack like Western Rome did. Western Rome didn't realize its own shortcomings. And this sort of stuff happened because of that. It wasn't prepare. It wasn't prepared to repair itself. It feels like so. It opened it up, itself up to sackings and just this chaos in general. That's kind of where I've landed on this one, Paul. They've definitely spiraled out mm. of control, it's, and it controlled that for all intents and purposes they would never regain. In the it's West. like you know that meme of the dog and the house on fire. Like this is fine. That's exactly it's, what it is. It's, That's exactly it's literally what that. Is. That's exactly what's happened. And that, mm. my interesting friends, you listening or watching, wherever you may be listening or watching, is the story of one Alaric the First. And I am happy, nay, deeply gratified <laughs> to share with you this very interesting figure, whom, as I mentioned at the beginning of the first part of this particular history, that I came into interest for due to a very, very tangential reason, as it was the German codename for an Allied double agent during World War II that was working for MI5. To the Abbear, he was known as Alaric, and to British and MI5, he was known as Garbo. Mm. And it is a very interesting history in terms of finding that opening there. But us here, you there, and we'll be back right after a word from the voice of AD History herself, Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast. Well, that does it for us today. Patrick, where can people find us? You can find me personally, primarily on Instagram at NameExplainYT. But you can also find me on Twitter at NameExplainYT. And of course, on YouTube, search NameExplain. What about you, Paul? In addition to my usual work at TGNR at TGNReview.com, you can find me at my Twitter handle at PKD in History, as well as my reader-submitted World War II Q&A column, The World War II Brain Bucket, where I answer all World War II-related questions, which, if you are on YouTube, we will have a link down in the description. That's all today for myself. Goodbye, thank you, and take care. Yes, thank you all so much. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History Podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at ADHistoryPC as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash adhistorypodcast and Instagram 
as AD History Podcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. For Paul and Patrick, thank you for listening to the AD History. We'll see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.